Welcome everyone to week two of uh, KBHC 2022 OnCamp Connect Live on KBHC 2022. Uh, so um, <laughs> uh, we have a small but dedicated crowd this morning. Alan, Ben, Lupe, and Candy, thank you for joining us. Good to see you all. Um, so uh, this is going to be very similar to what we did last week. Uh, you're with us. I, in fact, I know that you're with us. Um, so we're going to be running through basically the same thing, just our, our song of the day is going to be slightly different. So, um, yeah, let's go ahead and launch right into it. <clears throat> all right, so starting from the very beginning, this uh, warm-up is designed for all ages and ability levels, right? Uh, it's a progressive warm-up in the sense that each day we will add material and build upon what we've done in the previous days. Beginning of the week, the material will be very basic and we'll take time to explain each exercise in some detail. We will do less explanation as the week goes on for the sake of time. Um, by the end of the week, the material will get very advanced. We encourage everyone to do only what they are able to do. Don't force anything. Feel free at any time in the warm up to take rests, go at slower speeds, and play with your comfortable limits of range and the like. All the material in this package is meant as a starting material for you to work with as you begin to build and craft your own individual warm-ups or routines. So feel free to uh, alter the exercises by changing things like modes, rhythms, articulations, etc. So Bernard and I are very much of the opinion that this is a warm-up of 30,000 different warm-ups that you can do, and there's no perfect one or one right, right way to do it. It's, it's based on what, uh, what your needs are for this specific day. So. You know, some people are routine based and they want to do the exact same exercises in the exact same order every single day. And other people uh, find that to be monotonous and boring and they want to reorganize their exercises every day or leave some out or add some in. So uh, absolutely feel free to tailor this to your own needs. Um, <clears throat> we will not be dealing too much with dynamics during the week, but we encourage you to add some dynamic variety to the mix. Uh, the sing, buzz, play, create concept we introduced during the song of the day can be applied to any of the exercises. Um, after the sing, buzz, play, create, we begin ordering the material from the simplest to the most complex in the form of free buzz, mouthpiece, harmonic series, and then the addition of vowels. When you gain more familiarity with the material, feel free to order all of this differently in whatever way works for you. That's basically what I was just saying earlier. Uh, at the end of each session, uh, there will be some time for questions. So we hope that you enjoy this. I know that many of you are familiar with it having joined us before, but we're going to keep going through it. So let's um, go ahead and start with our stretching. So for this, I recommend standing up. Staff member uh, John Wonderland is in the room with us and it looks like you're gonna join us for some stretching. So this is all about just getting physically ready to play the horn, okay? So what we do is physical in nature. That's why you hear people relate musicians to athletes, okay? We can, we can get playing injuries. They can last a while, all right? I've had friends and colleagues who have been out for months or even years uh, out of the orchestra because of playing injuries or playing related injuries. Uh, so uh, having body awareness and, and physical wellness is, is a top priority in what we're going to do for the long term. So stretching, we're going to get the body warmed up. Twists, we're gonna twist from side to side, okay? Doing one this way and one that way, that's one rep, all right? Don't overdo it, just feel whatever is comfortable. Nothing really needs to be rigid. It's just about um, twisting and what, whatever feels comfortable. So let's do 10 reps, here we go. One. Ten. Okay, good. All right. Next one. Fold over ten counts. Okay. We're just gonna reach down very easily toward your toes. All right. I can't even come close to reaching mine, but you want to just kind of point in that direction. Okay. So bending forward, folding over ten counts. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we roll up slowly. Okay. Very 
Okay, good. All right, side bends. Uh, there are two ways to do side bends. You can pull your arm in the, in the uh, away from the direction that we're going to lean, or you can have your arm up and over like this. Either way is fine. I think Bernard likes the pulling. I tend to do the up and over. So let's start with the up and over today. So basically, uh, let's reach all the way for the ceiling and then just slowly bend your body over this way. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Good. So you should feel a nice, really long stretch all the way down that side. Let's do the other side. Reach for the ceiling and bend over. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Awesome. Okay. Arm rotation. So for me, this is particularly important. I uh, tend to experience back and shoulder pain when I'm playing. That's um, historically just been my experience with it. So getting the shoulders opened up and and you know, muscles in the back all uh, loosened really, really helps me. So the first thing is arm rotations, okay? A full rotation is like this, if you can, right? Again, just you want to get full rotation of the rotator cuff as much as it's comfortable, okay? And then the same is going forward. So you can feel how even just trying a couple slow ones feels good, right? Just getting full range of motion. Cool. So we're going to do 10 reps backward, okay? So let's do 10 counting backwards. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Awesome. Okay, 10 forward, same concept. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, So shoulder shrugs, this is all about getting maybe your neck and your traps a little more relaxed, okay? It's not so stiff in the morning as mine are. So we're gonna do 10 reps backwards. That's a full rotation similar to what we just did, right? All the way around. And then 10 reps forward, just go the same, same direction, okay? So let's do 10 reps backwards starting. Here we go, 10 shoulder rows. One, two, forward. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, that's it for stretching. Feel free to kind of shake it out. <sighs> Getting ready to play. Yeah, awesome. So that takes us right into breathing. Why is breathing important? Well, it's fairly simple, okay? Air is our fuel on the horn, or for any brass playing or woodwind playing in general, okay? So if it's our fuel, of course, we want the highest quality fuel that we could possibly have, right? So that means not only, not only learning how do we take it in, how much can we take in, and then how do we use it? How do we get rid of it, right? So breathing and body awareness with breathing is, is hugely important, tremendously important for what we do on the horn. We can't make a single sound on these instruments without air, all right? So we want really high quality air. Um, so uh, if you were here last week, you remember that we did a uh, hand motion up like this. Okay, so first of all, before we start that, I wanna get our syllable going, all right? So if you say uh, the word like P-O-E or O-H, okay? Po or O, right? What do you notice that, that the syllable of the mouth is doing? Jaw is dropped, oh, right? The embouchure is round, the corners are in, the tongue is down, oh. And if you say oh a couple of times, what is the throat doing? Is it closed? No, it's open, right? Just like the beginning of the word open, oh, open. So with that nice open syllable, we're going to inhale, but we're gonna put the hand up and add a little bit of resistance. And the idea here you want to hear a nice, low-pitched whooshing noise. We're just going to 
sound like. All right. Give that a couple tries. So you want that light, that really cool, there's a certain resonance to it that you notice. Uh, if you're hearing things like, okay, or it's making a lot of noise when you inhale, then it means that something is closed off, either my throat or, you know, um, or my embouchure isn't open enough, okay? When I do that, I find that the, the body's natural physical reaction is to open the throat, right? Open the jaw, drop the tongue, and get your air really, really nice and low. So you want to think like belt buckle range for where this air is going. Okay, let's do a couple more O breaths with the hand up. Cool. Let's do one more. Awesome. So you notice that I'm breathing, right? My shoulders are coming up a little bit. Um, that's totally acceptable. I'm not pulling them up. Okay, that kind of tension we want to avoid, but they're going to raise because they're stacked on top of my lungs and my lungs are filling in all directions with air, right? So you see my chest goes up too, all right? And I'm expanding on all sides. Yeah, good. So throughout all of our exercises, our breathing exercises through the week, you can use this, this technique for any of our inhalations, just so you can really train your body to get in high quality, uh, high qu large amounts of high quality air in a, in a pretty quick manner, okay? So uh, let's start with some in and out uh, basic counting exercises. What we're gonna do is we're gonna just count, basically, and we're gonna do three in, three out, four in, four out, five in, five out, and six in, six out, right? So with this rhythm, uh, what I want you to do is breathe all the way, uh, basically full, like we were doing with the O breaths and the hand resistance. When you get to the top, I wanna to make sure that you're keeping your throat open. So that little mechanism that we have in, our back, in the back of our throat, we don't wanna use that for any sort of holding. All just open throat breathing. So with that, I'm gonna count us off three for nothing. We're gonna do three counts in, three counts out, okay? One, ready, go. Three out. Okay, four in, one, ready, go. Four out. Good. Okay, five in, five out, three for nothing. One, ready, go. Five out. Awesome. Last one, six in, six out. One, ready, go. Six out. Good, nice deep breath in and out. So, some people like to put the hand up like this when they're exhaling, just to kind of feel like you have uh, another uh, point of awareness for your speed of exhalation, okay? It's perfectly reasonable, it's not required, so it's up to you what you like to do the best. The last thing we're gonna do with our breathing for today is building the first half of capacity breathing. Capacity breathing is all about figuring out what is 100% full for you, okay? So for me, it's gonna look like this. So what you, what you notice that I did is I tanked up to what I could define as 100% or as much as close to 100% as possible. Then I took two open throat sip breaths on top of that. Now with my sips, because ideally I got to 100% with my first breath. So with my two sip breaths, even though I'm aiming for 101 and 102% of air, I really didn't get much in because I was already at 100. But I want you to get used to that idea of we're, we're physically training our bodies to really find our maximum expansion point in a comfortable way, okay? So hopefully this doesn't create too much tension for you physically uh, in the body. 
If it does, please put it in the chat and we can address it. Um, but I will demonstrate that one more time um, and then we'll do it together as a group, okay? So I did it with the hand the first time. This time I'm gonna do it without just so you can see what's going on. Here we go. Right, really pull those lungs open on the two sip breaths. It's really, really important. Okay, so let's do this all together. This is the first half of what's called a capacity breathing exercise. We're going to bring the, build the other halves of this exercise in further in later days. Okay, so let's do three 100% breaths with the throat open, and then we're going to take two sip breaths on top of that. Okay, here we go. First one. Two more. So this next one I'm going to do with the hand up, okay? So I can get my nice, nice open throat, right? Open jaw, low tongue, open throat, air's going all the way down. Next one, here we go. Oh, yeah. Starting to feel good, feel that awareness of your, your full capacity, right? Last one, here we go. Awesome. Nice deep breath in and out. Let it all go. All right. We need to get used to this idea that uh, air is free. That's This is the one kind of fuel in our life that's free. And man, do we notice it right now especially. So uh, let's move on to our first notes on the horn. So you can sit back down for this one. Still too high. There we go. All right. So um, we're going to start with free buzzing, but I say all the time, free buzzing is not a prerequisite to great horn playing. Right? I became what I would call an able horn player long before I ever developed any sort of free buzz. So that could certainly be the case for you too. But it is good to try them and to be aware of free buzzing and to incorporate it into your daily or weekly practice. So we're going to start with free buzz. What's nice about the way that we're building these and the reason why we do the free buzz next is because we've built our air, we've got our body warmed up. Now we're going to add buzz okay, in a, in a really simple approach uh, manner. So wherever is comfortable for you, I just want you to try a free buzz. <laughs> is you're adding just enough tension, right? Just enough tension to um, get a nice stable buzz. So let's take that free buzz and our mouthpieces. Let's buzz it on the mouthpiece, okay? Again, wherever, uh, wherever you're, wherever is most comfortable for you to buzz, it's totally fine. It's just about first notes for the day, okay? Let's give that a try. <sighs> We have printed here that we want to do a breath attack using seashell air to produce your best sound. Okay, seashell air is uh, basically creating that seashell sound in our horn without buzzing. Okay, so that's going to sound for me like. All right, it's a subtle sound, but hopefully you guys were able to hear that. If not, you can actually do it yourselves and you'll see what I'm talking about. But the idea is to start the air moving first and then add enough good tension into the buzz, uh, into the embouchure until it starts buzzing, okay? So it's gonna sound like this. <laughs> It's fine 
if it feels a little bit unstable at first, mine did actually, and you just blow into that instability, okay, blow through your note and uh, to, toward a point of getting really stable and comfortable and grounded on that note. So I came in on a G, that was what was comfortable for me. Most people will find that either a C, G, or E at the bottom of the treble plus staff is gonna be the most comfortable for them. So let's try this all together. Pick a note that's comfortable and uh, blow some seashell air and get a nice first note of the day. start to taper at the end in a really nice and cared for and supportive way. Good. So let's move on to our next exercise, Oh Do Do. So uh, this is all about getting our, our air and our buzz that we built and then adding a relaxed articulation on top of it. Um, many times I think the tongue is actually a hindrance in our playing. Okay, A lot of times players think that, oh, I can't start playing unless I start by articulating something, okay? But then what ends up happening is, right, okay, we get stuck behind our air and, and then nothing's moving, you can't release the tongue and it's feeling really awkward. Okay, that's because what you're trying to do is you're trying to start everything with the tongue, right? If you start with your air and your buzz and you simply line up the tongue with the air and the buzz, it's much easier to articulate and you're starting instead of from a, a stagnant place of, of no movement, you're, you're already moving the air toward a buzz and then you add your articulation into it. So that is all what Ho Do Do is about. We're gonna start on C. First note of each of these groupings is air articulated. And then we add a nice easy Do that lines up with the air and the buzz. It's gonna sound like this. exercise once. Ho do do, right? You can see that the tongue is quick and very easy. It doesn't completely intersect the air, it just rides on top of it or underneath of it, however you want to think of this. Let's do this whole exercise around quarter and equal 60. We're going to try to stay on the F horn. You don't have to if you don't want to, but I recommend it. Uh, doing F horn practice uh, for those of us who are used to the B flat horn is, is really good exercise. So let's do this together. Ho do do, or for nothing, I'll count us off. One, two, ready. Um.
I was spinning my air in such a way it was causing a little bit of vibrato, right? Um, that's no problem at all. Okay, we can already start warming up a nice, warm, easy, active sound that's spinning and going somewhere, even with the hododos. So, okay, let's move right along. Hold on a second. Let's do something else. Okay. So, that takes us to our song of the day. Right? We were going to recognize this song. It's very common, right? It's a household tune. Right? Little did you know it was written by Brahms. Okay. Egan Lied. Right? Starts on, on our E. Okay. You can sing it however you like. Okay. Uh, solfez, you can sing words, you can sing syllables, la, da, you can do ah, oh, right? Whatever works for you is totally fine. So I'm going to sing it on Solfege, because I know that our faculty member, Natalie Grana, would be super happy about it. So, all right, should we try singing this together? We're going to start on E. Okay, that's our me, if you're in Solfege. Okay, counting three for nothing, let's sing this together. One, two. Me, me, so, me, me, so, me, so, do. Nice high range, okay, excellent. <laughs> you might know it as a lullaby, all right? It's putting me to sleep, especially since I'm completely sleep deprived here at Horn Camp. Awesome, let's try buzzing it on the mouthpiece. You can articulate it if you want with that nice easy dough articulation we warmed up earlier, but if not, you can also slur it, all right? I'm gonna choose to articulate it. Let's buzz it together, I'll count us off. One, go. <laughs> something sound easier by working harder, okay? Don't try to make your horn do what you want it to, right? Start with the buzz and the mouthpiece, right? And the horn, let the horn do what it naturally wants to do based on what you're putting into it. Okay, let's try this together on the horn. Count us off. Ready? Go. <laughs> theme okay <laughs> seems like it should be warming us down for the day but still warm up uh, from here you can uh, create and customize this however you like okay do some improv as I'm sure no doubt Bernard would be doing right now okay I will use my imagination for he is doing that upstairs with our participants right now so awesome let's keep going so free buzz builder Again, this is, uh, I'll be totally honest, not one of my favorite exercises, but uh, it's here and we're going to do it. So, Bernard likes to start around a C, okay? I can't really start down there, so I'm going to start on a G. G. Okay, we're just going to simply go up two notes and right back down, okay? It's going to sound like this. Let's try it all together really slowly. We're going to do by pitch by pitch. What you're trying to do is gain pitch control of your free buzz, which again, I know is not an easy thing for everybody. It's definitely not easy for me. So let's do that slowly together. All right. Uh, starting on G together. So we'll build more on that in the, in the coming days. 
mouthpiece sirens. This I can start on C, because there's a mouthpiece, right? So we're going to start on C here, and uh, we're going to blow all the way through a really nice slow gliss up to an octave above where we start, and get right back down to where we started. This is going to take a significant amount of air, so really get to your 102% capacity air. All right, and as, as we ascend and we start to gliss, you might notice that your lip is hitting bumps, okay? Where it's saying, no, I don't wanna go any further. Or, we've gotta change, or, we've gotta move, or there's something different we have to do, okay? Try to blow through the resistance, feeling nice, good, firm grip with the embouchure. So firm grip can be a little bit dangerous for some people in terms of like, well, what does that mean? What do you mean by firmness? I don't know about tightness, blah, blah, blah. So we all have these fang teeth here, okay? So I want you to take your corners and just hug the fangs for a second, all right? Yeah, just pull those corners nice and tight, tight, shouldn't use the word tight, nice and firm against those fangs, okay? Some people think of it as like pillows against the teeth. Other people think of it as pillars on either side of the embouchure, okay? These nice firm corners. They shouldn't feel uncomfortable, and it kind of should feel like, you notice, how, you notice how I can still talk with firm corners? It looks a little funny, all right? That's because my lip stays relaxed in between my firm corners. So it gives me a nice, stable foundation for my embouchure, okay? So I want you to employ firm corners as we do these mouthpiece sirens. Firm corners also, another great thing about firm corners is it keeps you from smiling when you play. I love smiling otherwise, but when you play, it's really not a good thing, okay? A lot of times you see when people take a breath, okay? Okay, do you see what I just did? I took a breath and my corners went all the way back. Well, what happens when we smile like that is it stretches the lip. And when you set on a stretched lip, it's not a very high quality buzz and it's not very comfortable. That's when people start using what's often referred to as the Armstrong method, okay? using your arm to smash the mouthpiece into your face. So uh, yeah, keep those corners firm, keep them in. You can think of even a phrase that people use a lot or I use a lot when teaching is to kiss the mouthpiece, okay? So I'm thinking about all of that as I'm doing my mouthpiece siren here. I'll demonstrate once so you can get a good idea of what it's gonna sound like. <sighs> Nice and controlled. Again, I'm blowing through my line, through the notes, not at them. So let's do one that's a little bit faster than that. We'll do it all together. So here we go. Nice deep breath, 102% capacity. So I said 102% capacity, but I also must recognize that we're really not used to playing our horns from being that full. And it could seem really uncomfortable to some. So it's fine if you want to aim for the 90 to 95% capacity range, if that's a little bit more of a comfortable starting spot for you. Uh, so we'll build on our mouthpiece sirens as we go get further into the week. Now we get to move on to our harmonic series and build those. So harmonic series is, is incredibly important for the horn, all right, because that's how we get our different pitches. Uh, so many people approach me and say, well, how do you get so many notes if you only have these three buttons? Okay, well, it's the harmonic series. And when I explain that, it typically is kind of like, whoa, I had no idea. Oh my gosh, you have to get all those different notes just using your lip? Yeah, well, how do you know you're on the right one? Ah, you have to develop your ear, okay? You have to know what, what, what pitch you're on, okay? So, um, yeah, it's vitally important for us as horn players. So we're just going to build this. We're starting on C. 
a nice F open horn, okay? And we're gonna go up to, uh, let's see, what do we have here? Yeah, we're going up an octave from where we start, which is gonna be these pitches. <laughs> You can either basically kind of do the mouthpiece siren that we did, but you're doing it on the horn, so you're bending. It's going to sound like this. It's a little bit easier for me to bend in that, in that manner descending. That's one way to approach it. Another way to approach it, if you're already familiar with your harmonic series, is to make it a bit more notched. Okay, so that you're aiming for each pitch. Uh, this can be beneficial because then you're involving your, your ear in listening for which where the next pitch is. That's going to be more. So you can hear how the pitches snap into place a little bit more, right? So let's do this together. We're going to start with the first line. Just going to do C, E, C, and we're going to add a note one at a time until we get uh, our octave above where we start, okay? So it's going to be uh, do, mi, do. Okay, first one, here we go. Two, ready. Let's add the G to that. series. Now, as I found out this past week, because we had some Alphorn players who were here at the camp, this is the fundamental concept of being able to play an Alphorn, right? So, um, uh, it's, it's really fun. The, their harmonics are slightly different in terms of the distances on an Alphorn than, than a regular uh, horn as we're used to it. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but that's, that's how you play Alphorn, right? So, Two. Mm -hmm. 
second valve, right, that's our half step valve. Our first valve, that's a whole step valve in terms of descending, right? This lowers us a half step, this lowers us a whole step. Third valve that lowers us one and a half steps. It's with these three combinations that our instrument can be fully chromatic. So just another way to think about it, it's like, oh, I need to go down a whole step. What, well, I could just push down the first valve and it will go down one whole step. Very good. Okay. Uh, so we would continue this uh, in eighth notes, ascending back up to where we started. I trust that you can do that on your own. All right, it would sound like this, from eighth F sharp. And so on and so forth. I'm gonna skip that in the interest of time. Okay, so lip trill builder. Uh, this is a great example of an exercise that today is going to start on fairly, fairly easy side, all right, and uh, will advance to a much more challenging version of itself in, over the six days, which generally for most people, unless you're like a freak of nature on the horn, uh, is not going to be totally attainable over the course of six days. This is more like three months progression. But we're, we're giving you the building blocks here day by day just so you understand how it's going to go. So uh, with the harmonic series, we're bending between pitches, right? And we're trying to learn that moment where the note flicks up, right? With trills, you want to have similar awareness. It's about learning where the note flicks to the next note. And, and feeling it here. Okay. Trills are all about being able to feel them in the lips. So starting on A, we're just gonna go nice and slow. I want you to try this with me right now. It's just gonna go slowly back and forth between an A and the harmonic above it, okay? <laughs> lip trill you can do right now is that's totally fine okay that's a, that is technically a lip trill it's just very slow right uh, but you want to stay in this realm of control and then challenge yourself to increase that speed in a controlled manner so that you can stay in control of the flick if you practice trills faster than you can control them and they're out of, uh, and they're, they're, they're uneven, right? All you're doing is you're reinforcing and practicing uneven trills. And you'll have to come back later and slow them back down and even them back out. And I am speaking from firsthand experience because for years I had uneven trills and it finally caught up with me as a professional. And I was like, this is not okay. I have to go back and rebuild everything that I thought I had done in the past. And I wish I would have started the right way from the beginning. So, the way that this is printed out, it uh, starts in half notes, then quarters, then eight, eighths for today. So we're gonna do. Right, 
that's the speed I'm going to start for with today. If it's too fast for you, no problem, but you get the idea. Let's do this together. Anyone who wants to give it a shot. Uh, one and two fingering combination on the F horn. Here we go. Two. Ready. <laughs> coming from a nice 
relaxed approach that we've already built with our previous exercises, okay? Spinning your air through the line, through your nose. Let's build our articulated chromatic scales now, okay? Starting on C, you can use any of the preference of articulation that we've talked about before, all right? I'm gonna use probably a D syllable, some form of do or da, okay? Maybe even a do. do, 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 do. Let's do it both on the F and the B flat horn, okay, using all of my fingerings. So, starting on the F horn, about that speed. F horn. One, two, ready. Last one, F, three. 
basically brings us to the end of our warm up. So these will uh, advance uh, to uh, greater levels and we'll add some arpeggios, we'll add range, we'll add speed. All right, hopefully by the end of this week, you'll be uh, ludicrously skilled at your scales, right? Good thing to know all the time. Um, <clears throat> so before we transition into the next hour of our On Camp Connect Live from KBC 2032, uh, I can answer any questions if you have them in the chat. I recognize that many of you are expert Horn Camp Connect attendees, and so you likely have had all of your questions all right, answered, but I'm here to help if you have any. So, here we go. Are we all set? I don't see any questions in the chat okay. at the moment. Awesome. So if you'd like to come over here, just hang out for a right. second. So, we're going to transition over to Stasia's presentation for the next hour. All right. I hope that you all enjoy it. I enjoy working with Stasia and hearing her perspectives. Um, yeah, so have a good hour. See you all soon. All right, so Jesse, we do actually have a question. If you'll come over and hang out while Stasia's getting yeah. all set up for her session. So good morning. I'm sorry for the slight uh, audio interesting things that are going on right now. Uh, I, I do think that there's not a whole lot we can do on this end, and I'm very, very sorry for that. Uh, but I do see your comments, and I'll look into it just to see for tomorrow. So that being said, Jesse. Yes. Lupe That's asks, with trills, are you moving muscles in the embouchure or just air? Ah, OK. Let's see. Let me think about that. Let me give it a try. OK, it's got to be muscles, too, because I just tried moving air, right? And nothing moved. The notes stayed the same pitch. So I've got to think about increasing, like I was talking about, good tension. Everyone's so afraid of the T word. Oh my God, he said tension. Okay. You've got to increase good tension in the lip, all right, and to, to where to the point where the note flicks to the next one. So. To if you think of, you know, everyone's blown up a balloon, right? And then you squeeze the top of it, right? And it makes that squealy pitch, okay? If you increase tension on it, what happens to the pitch? It goes up, right? So if you let it go, it goes down. If you let out too much tension, what happens? The vibration stops and it makes no noise. It just goes, okay? <laughs> so it's an analogy that's good uh, to think about in terms of good tension in the lip. Perfect. Cool. Can you come to this side of me because I can see you better? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Oh, okay. it's a whole new side of you. I know. Surprise. <laughs> My ponytail's over here and everything. Um, so if there are any more questions for Jesse, I'm happy to answer them. Well, I'm not happy to answer them. Jesse's happy to answer them, <laughs> and I'm happy to have him do that for you. Um, but in the meantime, Jesse, what are you most excited for about week two? What am I most excited camp? for of week two? Oh, my gosh. Um, Sunny days since we've had a couple that have been rainy. True, fair <laughs> enough. It's also been very cold here. Um, it's been in which, the like forties overnight, okay. which I am a huge fan of. But I don't think I'm joined by everyone on that. Any of you who are experiencing the heat wave that's going on in the U.S. of 103, 104 degrees are probably a bit envious. So yeah, it's been nice and cool all year. It really has. But, um, yeah. That's one of the many things I'm looking forward to the week too. Yep. So getting to know all of our new campers that came in this week. That's another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that should be very fun. I think so. And our faculty. We have mostly new faculty this week. So getting everybody acclimated and, and up and running in camp. Yep. Yeah. Um, Good. Well, all right. Great. Thanks so much, Jesse. Yeah. We'll see you in a couple days. See for you all in a couple days. More warm ups. In the meantime, we'll head back over to Stasia in just a second. We're breaking on it. 
And I'm so sorry that it was 95 there last week. I'm sure that most people are experiencing that right now, but oh man, this heat wave is quite stressful. So anyway, back. Hello everyone, we were just dealing with a few issues about screen sharing, so good morning, my name is Stasia Siena, I'm so happy to be here at Kendall Betts Horn Camp. This morning we are going to be uh, talking about the Alexander Technique. The, the title of my talk this morning is Performance Vitality for horn players, lessons from the Alexander Technique. And mainly, we're, I'm just gonna be trying to draw connections for you all about why the Alexander Technique is important to you as uh, human beings, musicians, but then in particular, the connections between Alexander Technique and horn playing. So vitality, what is it? Um, kind of wanna give a broad definition or thought about vitality really just talking about the energy that is in the body, the energy that's available to us, the ease, the freedom, the flow of all the good stuff, breath, air, the things that make us able to do what we do well, make you all as horn players able to play your horns at maximum capacity, how to maximize your vitality. So I'm just going to quickly, so I've got my computer here in front of me, I'm going to quickly just read a definition. This is just a textbook definition of vitality. The state of being lively, strong, and active, full of energy, physical or mental vigor, vital force or principle. I heard Jesse say just at the end of his warm up, he was, the, the word tension came up. And I want to really, you know, make no mistake about this. There is a degree of postural tone always at work in the body. And we need that energy, that tension, the engagement of the musculature to do things. So the Alexander technique is about how to maximize that tone. Sometimes we need engagement to allow ourselves to do what we want to do. So I'm gonna screen share for a moment. And we're going to, a couple things, how this little uh, session is going to work. So we've got about an hour together. Uh, I'm going to show you a few slides and just give you a basic introduction to kind of fundamental ideas about the Alexander Technique. We're going to run through the slides rather quickly. Some of you may already have a basis in the Alexander Technique. And then I've got um, a live body, a real live horn player, my colleague, Peggy Moran is here to demonstrate a couple of the things and concepts that we're going to talk about. So stay tuned. We're going to screen share for just a moment. Here we go. And pull up my slides. Good. So I'm hoping that all of you can see well. And it's lovely to see a few faces over there on the column. I, um, I'm just going to scroll down, or I can't really scroll down well, but it's lovely to see a few familiar names and a couple of familiar faces. So hello, everybody. It's really nice. Hi, Ben. I see you waving. Alan, good to see you. Lupe, just wonderful that you're all here. Performance vitality for horn players. So the question, the first question that I want to answer for those of you especially that are brand new to the Alexander Technique is this question of what the Alexander Technique is. So if you think about, first of all, this, this notion of vitality, it might be helpful to think in terms of kind of a garden hose and what happens when we have a kink in the hose. So if you think about your watering your flowers, you've got you know, your, your garden in front of you and then your hose has a kink in it, that water doesn't run through quite as easily. And so we kind of have to undo the kink for water to flow through easily. The Alexander Technique at its core is about getting really curious about what those 
kinks, as it were, are in our own bodies and minds. What are the habits that we have embodied? They could be physical, they could be mental, they could be psycho so psychological, emotional. Getting really curious about what's going on in these minds and bodies of ours and how that affects us. So a quick little demonstration, if you're uh, watching right now with us at home, in just getting a clear sense of what obstacles, what kinks in the hose, what kinks in the mind-body connection do in terms of our, or how they impair or get in the way of the flow of ease and vitality and energy. So we all use cell phones. So those of you at home can kind of join me. Keep going. <laughs> I see Lupe smiling there, right? And actually Lupe, is that, I don't know if that's a coffee cup that you're holding, but any type of beverage is also a really good uh, kind of stimulus to bring us into a bit of a little tiny slump. So I want you all at home to just take a little cell phone slump, like you're looking at your phone to text, or if you imagined, great Ben, I see you grabbing your phone, or Lupe's got her hands around a cup. So you kind of are just going from a nice upright posture to just a little tiny slump. And when you do that, I just want you to raise your arms up over your head. Yeah and then bring them back down. Now, sit up well, just meaning take the kink out of the hose. And whatever that means for you, just bring yourself up out of the slump and then raise your arms. And no special way to raise your arms, just raise them up over your head, just move them a little bit, okay? We'll call that B, very nice. Okay, now go back to A, your little tiny cell phone slump. Hello, well done. <laughs> And then raise your arms again. And really pay attention to the quality, the vitality, the ease, the freedom in your body. Good. And then go again back to that unkinked toes. Kind of remove the obstacle and raise your arms. Good. Nice. So when you do that, just starting to turn on your awareness, I imagine that most of you experienced a bit more lightness and ease and mobility, right? I see some of you nodding your heads. When you unkink the hose, when you take that little pull from the body and you just give a little thought to bringing yourself up to your full height, widening your shoulders, things just move easier and they're lighter. So this is just a little sort of demonstration number one about getting curious what other habits might we have in our bodies, in our minds that are creating obstacles. We call them habits. What habits do we have? So I'm gonna move my, theoretically, I just need to be able to move my slides forward, which I can't do right now. So hang on and we will bring some technical support Sorry. over here. <laughs> While they're fixing the screen, I, um, what, what I wanna do is just establish a really clear common denominator for all of us. We have a group objective here, right? Whether as an individual, you might have particular uh, objectives, goals as a musician, as a horn player, but collectively our, our initiative, our objective is to get better at what we do, to evolve. And, and this session I'm giving this morning is how to start thinking about how you can bring this method of the Alexander technique, the heart of that, this curiosity about the mind and body and how this whole instrument of the self works. So we want to kind of establish a, a clear definition of what the Alexander technique is. There I am with a young horn player at our old location, which was Camp Ogons, so Lake Ogons here in New Hampshire. Um, 
What is the Alexander Technique? It's a method for identifying changing habits, cultivating ease and awareness, building and refining skill, including your ability to align, integrate, breathe, and coordinate well. The renewal of one's personal well-being is an indirect benefit. The Alexander Technique involves learning how to better learn. If that channel is open, the flow of information and energy is different than if we have habitual obstacles that we have developed over time in our minds and in our bodies. Just getting really interested in what is happening in ourselves. The Alexander Technique is a tool for optimizing outcomes. It will help you maximize your performance vitality. So we're gonna flip over here to our next slide. Wonderful example of vitality, ease, freedom, and poise. So another part of the definition of what the Alexander Technique is involves this force, this physical force that's bearing down on us all the time. It, it is part of the definition is, is understanding the implications of gravity on our minds and bodies. You see with this, this baby, almost toddler, how the baby is thrusting up from that hand that's making contact with the floor and the head is just going up beautifully and there's a little arm up off the floor, poised for movement, big smile on the baby's face. Joyful coordinated movement develops through early childhood. The Alexander Technique is a relearning process. So gravity doesn't have to pull us down. And you know, when you take a look at this slide and just if you, uh, you're certainly welcome to jump down on the floor and, and put yourself in this, if you put yourself in this particular coordination right now that this baby is in so effortlessly, you know, we'd be heaving our cores up off the floor and holding our torsos in the air. And so they getting starting to, to understand, well, how can I do, how can I relearn to be more effortless, more easeful in our bodies? Gravity. Why the Alexander Technique? You know, so we start to get a sense for what it is. Well, why is it important? Well, gravity is part of the reason that learning how to access your onboard anti-gravitational device, which is what we call as Alexander teachers the primary control. It just means that there's an order of things. And when we are disordered, when we have kinks in the hose, when there are obstacles, habits that get in our way, that order is disengaged. The order is disordered. So thinking broadly about the anatomy of a slump, the idea is that the order of things is at the head, is balancing up here on the top of the spine. And you can see from this slide, this is just you know, a two-dimensional rendering. In a moment, we're gonna bring Peggy into the frame and we can also work with this. If you're here with us in person, I'd love for you to engage with the material in real time. If you just bring your hands up right here, so the few of you that I can see on the screen, if you bring your hands up to the sides of your head where your temple kind of just eases in, exactly, I see a few of you bringing your hands up, you're pointing up there right at the top of the spine. And just as a basic idea, your head is designed to balance on the top of the spine. So very gently, just let yourself nod from this top joint in a yes coordination or no, side to side, up and down, side to side. And we'll say that's just right there on the side of the head. You feel those temples. It's kind of where the glasses go back over the ear, right in through there is the top of the spine. The quality of this relationship, meaning quality of the freedom, the ease at the head, neck, joints, called the occipital joint, this impacts what's going on through the rest of the body. We're not going to belabor this too long in looking at this slide, but you just notice a few differences here. 
Where the head goes, the body follows. When that bowling ball of a head, it weighs 10 to 12, even 13 pounds in some individuals, when that head moves off of its delicate balancing point, it will 100% of the time bear an impact on what's going on below it. So thinking of obstacles to our vitality, to the flow of energy, we want to get really curious about what's going on with our head and neck, especially in worlds of technology, flat screens, computers, even our beverages, picking up a bottle. Do we collapse? What do we do? Call this the primary concern. What happens to me when I do things? You are all horn players. Your instrument, the horn, here is my public service announcement. It is the secondary instrument. You, my friends, are the primary one. The primary instrument is the individual playing the horn. And we want to understand what is going on with the self. Why the Alexander Technique for normal people, lay people, people who are not musicians? Well, because we're all in a body. And the implications of gravity, of civilization, of doing things, of falling into habits, they have a sort of predictable impact on all of us. But what we're really interested in today is what happens to horn players? Why is the Alexander Technique useful for horn players specifically? How do we maximize our capacities as musicians and grow and evolve and refine our skills as horn players? So there are a couple of horn specific challenges. And again, we'll just quickly go through these slides. One of those challenges, of course, is the weight of the instrument. Feel free if you are on the call with us, if you're on the class with us in real time, to add some of your own thoughts in the chat. What are some horn specific challenges? I've noted here the weight of the instrument, its asymmetrical design, the forward and down playing position. And I'll get to that in a moment when we bring our lovely assistant back to help with us. You see here, this is my, our colleague, our friend Sadie Glass, who's playing uh, Baroque horn. That position is not forward and down, it's actually up and it presents a number of different challenges to the body, how to do that well, how to do that easily. If you have other thoughts about the horn specific challenges, please put them in the chat. Our collective objective is to evolve as musicians and become better horn players, to further a sense of overall well being in ourselves, as well as rehabilitate existing injuries and prevent new ones. The Alexander technique is a method for just this. We also have individual objectives. Here are a couple of students of mine. I was working with them online who had objectives. One of these young men was very interested in working with his head and neck coordination. He had habitually held his neck really far, far forward. And here he's learning about the dynamic forces that help him to overcome the pull of gravity, how to come up and away from the hands. So you want to get curious about the overall collective objective, but then much more interesting is, well, what's going on in your individual body? So after we run through these slides, we're going to work with a couple of practices that will be useful to start getting the uh, creative juices flowing so that you'll have a couple of things that you can actually work with at home. There are a lot of materials on the Alexander Technique. You can read about it. You can study with an Alexander teacher. But really, the only way to learn the technique is to find a teacher to have lessons. There are group lessons that can be very effective. Working online can be very useful. Beginning to find some inroad to just understand what your individual habits are. I've given a few, just listed a few resources here. You can contact me and if you are watching this video later, you'll have my email address if you're 
here in real time, I want to invite you personally to join my Facebook group, which is The Balanced Art of Performance, Freedom, Awareness, Expression. If you're on, feel free to hop on Facebook right now and look that up and, uh, and ask for an invitation to join the group. It's where I'll continue this very conversation about Alexander Technique and horn playing. This group grew out of the online KBHC experience. So the whole Horn Camp Connect environment that developed out of the pandemic. Um, I had a lot of inquiries about how to work with the Alexander Technique at home. So the Facebook group is a place where I offer uh, instructions, Facebook Live instruction, video uh, tips, opportunity to ask questions. We've had a lot of discussions in my Facebook group about equipment, which I won't really be getting into today specifically, but in terms of our vitality and our energy and our bodies, it matters a lot, not only what we're doing with ourselves, but the way that we're interacting with specific elements of our environments. What kind of chairs are we sitting on? What are our office setups like? Yeah, I see some of you nodding. You, how is your, what's your computer setup, your office setup? Do you have the ability to raise and lower your chair? Do you have the ability to move your bodies in your workspaces? The body is designed for movement and we want to create environments that allow for that and that promote movement. So the ability to engage the muscle musculature in lots of different ways. So all of these things, uh, there's conversations, you can go back and read some of the things that have already been discussed on the Facebook page. If you're looking for a teacher in your area, you can go to the www.amsatonline.org and you can find lots of great information on that website. Reach out to me. Personally, I'm always available to help find teachers, connect, or to work with you personally online. So that comes to the end of my slides, which is really just a kind of basic introduction. So I'm gonna stop the share, hello, and come back to you full screen, and invite Peggy Moran, Dr. Moran, to join me for a little bit of So three practices that we are going to work with today. And first of all, I'm gonna bring, let's do this, Peggy. Let's start with Peggy just in standing. And I'm gonna move the computer screen up just a little bit. <laughs> there we are, getting, getting up close. So on the slide, you saw a depiction, so a rendering, uh, just a, on the flat dimension of the anatomy of a slump. So before we introduce Peggy as horn player, we're just introducing Peggy, Peggy as human being, who's gonna demonstrate, so here, right up here, at the top of the head, is the top, at the juncture here, at the top of the spine, is where that lanto-occipital joint connects your head to your torso. A lot of folks, Think about the neck as kind of ending here, which then begs the question, well, how is your head connected to the rest of your body? Really important for horn players, this connection of how the head and the rest of the body relate. So Peggy's going to show you what happens when we have this pull. So if she were to take her little cell phone slump, you see the head come forward, it tips off the top of the spine, and this is just the first phase of the slump. Her chest is narrowing, her back is widening. If she were to continue down in this same slumping pattern, which incidentally is sort of what happens with the passage of time. You see individuals where their pelvis has come back, their knees are locked, 
Their weight is all thrown toward the back of the body. Okay, you can come up out of that. <laughs> you don't want to stay in that. <laughs> yes, that, that unforgiving posture for too long. But the anatomy of a slump is a predictable cascading of energy down through the body. When the head comes forward, we collapse. So learning how to access our thrust up away from the floor. Alexander technique in person involves a little bit of hands-on work. But it also is very effective if we just turn on our own curiosity buttons and we begin to give ourselves some direction and guiding advice as we begin to assess, well, what's happening in my own self? So now we've got Peggy coming up more through the front. Her head is balancing on top of her spine. For those of you at home, one improvement in your sitting posture would be to just think about coming up and away from your screen. Good, I saw Lupe Diaz, she's the only person I can see right now in the screen, but the screen is a big pull forward and down. Ah, so if I start to think about how do I come up and away from that, well, why is that important pretty soon? And right now we're going to give a little demonstration of this. We're going to have Peggy pick up her horn. Yeah. So what are the pulls that pull us out of balance? They happen in the seated posture, the, the upright posture. They happen in all directions in the body. We noted a couple challenges of the horn, yeah? So it's also a challenge that this horn is so hard. This metal structure, this cold metal structure, bringing it up against the lively, soft, very mobile components of our physical self. The lips, the embouchure, this whole space around your mouth, bringing hard against soft. This is a very specific challenge of particular instruments. So, in the standing posture, we're asking Peggy to bring that horn up to her. And bring your horn down a second. The alternative here, friends, if this horn is really heavy and it starts to pull Peggy in this direction, and she's forward, and then she brings her horn up, her whole respiratory system in here is collapsed. And just kind of notice as she comes up to a standing posture. Some of you might be noticing this curve in the lower back. It's called the lumbar curve. It helps to support the body. Some of you may not look the same way Peggy looks from the side. I'm not suggesting that this is a destination that you should all see. This is just what's going on right here and now with Peggy. This is one consideration of many. A typical habit, and I'm just gonna lower her horn to about right here, that I see with horn players, is the tendency to bring the head to the mouthpiece, and we're gonna demo that again. So Peggy's coming up and away. She goes to play, she brings her head to the mouthpiece. You see how she's brought her head off that point of balance, and now she's already collapsing just a little bit through the chest. That is exhibit A. We're now going to go to exhibit B, where Peggy comes up and away and then makes the choice. We notice a habit, we have a choice. Now she has the habit to bring herself up and away. Go back to here. And if it, you're at home, you can try this. Put yourself in that little tiny slump again. Put yourself in your little tiny cell phone slump. And if you've got your horn, crump out just a little bit and try to take a breath. Try to take a breath with just a little bit of collapse in the chest. Got the lungs under there, the heart under there, the diaphragm, the air moves through here. Now bring yourself do what Peggy does. Lovely, bringing yourself up to your full height. Now try to take a breath. Prove that to yourself one more time. Just take the tiniest 
little slump. Oh, I'm just feeling a little bit lacking in vitality, a little bit of a kink in the hose. So for you, what do you notice when you do that? What, when you slump, what do you notice happening in your chest? Oh, this is tight and I can't get to it. Get right. where it's delivered. Oh, look. Yeah, and so Peggy is a horn instructor. This would be something she would instruct her students, but Alexander work is learning to instruct ourselves in the moment, assess what's happening, and make choices about how to do what we do better. So that starting position where we're bringing the horn up to Peggy would be much more conducive. And so we're gonna, I will take the horn down in just a second. So there are some practices that we work with with the horn. There are also practices, and we're going to just kind of run through a few of them with you right now. There are some other practices that are not horn specific. They're readying the mind and body to then bring a better overall coordination and use of ourselves to our experience. One of those is a practice that we call the lie down. And you're welcome to join for this little moment of rest, or you're, you're welcome to just kind of observe and then take this into your own practice. You see, mm -hmm. my head's cut off, so I will just move down onto the floor. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you, can, you want to put yourself on a nice, firm surface. If you're on a cushy surface, the nervous system just to sleep. Sometimes sleeping is exactly what you need when you're tired. But returning to the discussion about our friend, and excuse me one second, I'm going to grab a book for Peggy's head. Gravity pulls us down. And typically in the vertical arrangement and organization of the body, gravity pulls the head forward and down from the top of the spine. Very common with the weight of the horn for the horn to also dislodge in balance the head from its wonderfully delicate perch. Where the head goes, the body follows. So when we get down into this position that feels like a whole lot of doing nothing, I'm going to have Peggy come sit on the mat. The way you're going to set yourselves up at home, you're going to get a nice firm surface. Could be just on a carpeted floor. Use a yoga mat if you have one. You want to put a little book under your head to preserve, if you notice here, my top hand on the back of Peggy's head is slightly forward of my lower hand. It may not be something you've ever noticed before, but the head in its efficient balance alignment, it lifts slightly forward of the back of what's called here the torso, the thorax. So you want to preserve that when you come down onto the floor. So you're gonna have your knees up, your feet flat on the floor. Thank you, Peggy. And then you're just going to roll back. That book may be a little bit high for her head. You only really need about an inch to an inch and a half. If you're somebody who is a little bit collapsed, you can see how far forward the head is living. You'd want to fill in that gap by adding an extra book. I want to show you the difference here. Thank you. If I change that book, which is a nice algebra textbook, and I put in, this is also a mathematics textbook. We happen to be in a science room here. You see how her head takes a nice, easier rest on the book. Hands can be just resting. Of course, just being in this position feels good for the whole of ourselves. The vagus nerve is a very hot topic these days. It's uh, 
being studied a lot. A lot of folks are hearing about the vagal voyage. The vagus nerve is the 10th cranial nerve. It happens to govern the nervous system. Just as an interesting side note, this position alone changes the vagal tone. It decreases the heart rate and brings your blood pressure slightly down. So the vagus nerve regulates the part of the nervous system that revs things up. It regulates our ability to control things like stage fright, performance anxiety. So if you're somebody who tends toward anxiety, just this position alone is helpful. I'll say a little bit more about that as we go along. How do you feel on the floor? Pretty good. Yeah, so we've taken the body out of the vertical axis, put it on the horizontal axis. Now her spine is lengthening along the ground plane. Opens up the respiratory system. If you've spent time in front of your computer, on your phone, doing a lot of things with your hands, being very involved, just get down on the floor. It kind of cleans the slate. You don't need to stay down here endlessly. Just a few moments, you'll already gain the benefit. I'm going to show you in a moment, I really hate to bring her up off the floor. Everybody's been working long hours here at KBHC, but I am going to come over here. I'm just going to gently bring Peggy up off the floor. We'll return the screen to a position where you can see our heads. So, as I pick up Peggy's horn, and let her take a hold of that again. Coming up off the floor, she was already in a kind of very lovely, coordinated, upright position. But you begin to see how the floor relates to being upright. She now has gained a lot of awareness of the back body. So all these things that pull us forward, we start to really grow a body map, an awareness of this back part of ourselves. If I bring a chair over here, same thing applies. Peggy's now sitting. Back body. Head on the floor. You see how we start to grow some coordination and integration that helps take these habitual obstacles and just retrain ourselves, another way of doing things. Now she's got a nice open respiratory system, so that breath, and go ahead and just play a tone. You can take a nice breath and play. <laughs> Some instructors talk a lot about the lower back. Well, 
hips, the lower back, the middle back, the upper back, the whole thing expands. The rib cage goes all the way up here to the collarbones. So when we inhale and take in air, we think of widening, expanding. And then when we exhale, our management system, our anti-gravitational management, we're best served if we maintain this length of the torso. Our job is to keep ourselves from uh, descending with the ribs. So we're just gonna do this as a little exercise. When Peggy inhales, she's just gonna bring her arms up over her head. You can try this at home. You're inhaling and you're widening through the whole torso. And then you're exhaling and you're keeping of refinements here. Imagining that there's mass all around us as we inhale, keeping the ribs back, not necessarily allowing the back to pull up as the arms come up. Good. Inhaling again, opening the rib cage in three directions, and then stopping here for a moment. She's gonna turn her hands, turn your hands to the outside like you're pushing your hands through jello. And if you're at home, go ahead and try this and just even a slightly abbreviated fashion, arms come up and then exhale. So here we go with the lengthening and widening as Peggy inhales, she's gonna think widen. Widen, widen, arms come out. And then as she exhales, maintain the length of the torso. Anything that you notice doing that, Peggy, that's helpful for our friends watching? I think the widening helps. So when you're doing this, it's easy to pop up. So yeah, so kind of widening rather than just lengthening. Yes.
Another little practice that Peggy and I have never done before is one that I'm just going to show you the basics of this and then you can work with it on your own. You can also look for, um, we might uh, publish maybe a tutorial that we can make available on YouTube. This practice is called the cycle. It was developed by a colleague of mine named Neo Morales. So we want to give credit to Neo for coining the term the cycle. It's a really wonderful practice that is, to my mind, this is akin to sort of unkinking your own host. So, if you're watching at home, or for Peggy right here, I'm just going to ask you, and we're just going to go through the cycle together. Please join at home, or if you're watching later, you can try this on your own. I'm just going to ask Peggy, really lots of uh, stressors on one's mind and body when you're in a two-week camp, especially if you're the, <laughs> the executive director. <laughs> so instead of asking her what doesn't feel that great right now, because all of us are walking around a little underslept and the, the, you know, we're not in the comforts of home, so I'm sure we'd all have a long laundry list, right? A lot of us always have lots of complaints about what's going on in the mind and body. Interesting feature, though, is that we tend to focus on those things that we think about. So I'm going to ask you, what about if you shine just a light of awareness? So if you're imagining like the little, almost like the, 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 bat, the bat light here in <laughs> Gotham City, you know, the, the signal in the sky. It's like illuminating yourself from the inside out all the way from the top of the head through the whole body. Just with a light of curiosity, you're just investigating the whole interior, exterior. You're just noticing what feels okay. What part of yourself feels just fine? Try to come up with at least one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say this feels good right now. <laughs> okay, great. So if you're finding it difficult to notice a place that feels okay, ears in most people that are just taking a little ride on the side of the head, they tend to be a good place to think about ease and freedom and balance or the nose even. So just notice a place in yourself that feels just fine. And then Peggy's going to take a gentle hold. You can all try this at home. Either thumb. You can either grab the right thumb with the left hand or the left thumb with the right hand and then just allow your hands to rest. A refinement of this is to give yourself that little bit of a thought of coming up and away. And we're going to define this moment right here as what we call ground zero or just the number zero. When I say zero to my mind, it's like pinging a little text message up there saying, zero, I'm just going to turn on my curiosity button, start to get curious about what's going on in myself. For performers, I like to really establish this idea of an off and an on switch. When am I just hanging out in my body doing what I'm doing? And when am I turning on that switch to really begin to be aware and be on a path of making changes, integrating knowledge and lessons, practicing with objectives? So she's just starting to think about being in a space of awareness, noticing the inside of the self, the outside of the self. And I'm going to count to four. We're going to start with one. And Peggy's just going to ask herself, where in myself do I notice a bit of easing just right now in this and then two, where else do I notice ease? Three, where else? 
noticing, letting that light of awareness shine through your whole self. And then four. Relax, relaxing just a bit. Easy. And for our purposes today, we're just going to do one hand. You're going to go on to your index finger and take a light hold. One, relax, relaxing, just easy. Another possibility is to just say to yourself, I'm free to notice these. Two, three, four. Each time you hear the number, you just re repeat that question of yourself. Just no right answer, no judgment, just out to the ether. I'm free to notice these. One, two, three, four. And going on to the ring finger, just a light hold, no death grip on your own hand, just lightly grasping it like a robin's egg coming up and away. One. And then bringing down the voice that you hear coming from you, the instructor, and amplifying your own voice. Just noticing ease. Counting to two. And four. Notice if you're bumping up against your own fidgeting, your own to do list, the things that don't feel so good right now. Taking a hold of your pinky finger. One, relax, feel noticed just a bit of easing. Three, three, and coupling that with the sense of your own breath. Three on one of your head, two on the floor, and then number four. Bringing your awareness back to yourself, and I'm very curious with this little art body right here across from me, what she noticed as she went through that. There's this ease in your chest, your front part of the body. What else happened as you went through it? I feel like any sort of yoga idea of like noticing, I like kind of bringing ease, right? Like, okay, relax your feet or but make this, it happen. Right, make it happen. But this the allowing of noticing it. It was making it, it almost felt like each time I had a pinky finger a different body part. Like that last time, right here, it would be like, oh, there's ease here. And I go, oh. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. Yeah. Really cool. That's yeah. that's amazing. I have to say, the first few times that I worked with this process, I thought, oh, this fell off the end. Right now. There's really nothing going to happen. I mean, there's no, I, I'm like really used to do, I'm a yoga teacher. I'm a, I have to practice Pilates. You know, I'm used to the, do the hard stuff, you know, and I started doing this and I was really, I've been really amazed, impressed by the value of just this little bit of stopping and noticing and how much ease it promotes. And so, you know, I'm curious how, how it went for you all at home. Uh, please feel free to um, add your comments of what you noticed in the chat. Um, this is a practice that Feel free, this, you cannot hurt yourselves doing any of these things at home. Play with these exercises, go back and watch the video. Reach out to me if you have questions about how you can engage with practices of the mind and body to help increase your own vitality, your own access to your own 
inner channels of energy, they are at the foundation of your technique as a horn player. The only way to bring about a change in what you're doing on your instrument is to bring about a change in what's going on in this primary instrument of the self. So, Peggy, thank you very much for being here with me and to all of you for joining us this morning. It's been a great pleasure. I'm sure if I stand up, my head's going to disappear again. So here I, here I am. Thank you all. I'll look forward to seeing you the next time. Feel free to join my group and I will see you online. Thanks very much. If you have any questions, let us know. Take care. Wonderful. So thank you so much to Stasia. Um, Stasia, real quick. It's not like multiples of us. Got it. Yeah, so thank you so much, Stasia, for being here today. And thank you, Peggy, also for being her guinea pig. I know a couple of you had a couple of questions in the chat. If you'd like to email those to me at elizabeth at horncamp.org, you're more than welcome to do so. And I'll pass them along to Stasia and get you back an answer as soon as I can. Um, in the meantime, there are a couple of things, just a little couple of announcements for you. Uh, tonight in the email blast that I send out, I will be um, sending a link to Stasia's Facebook group just so you're aware, if you'd like to get ahead of me, it's the it's called the balanced art of performance, freedom, awareness, expression. I had to write it down because I get those last three words mixed up all the time in my head. I don't know. Um, also, if you would like to buy a shirt uh, to support us um, with the uh, Horn Camp Connect Live from KBHC t-shirts, I know a lot of you have done that already, and thank you so much for that. We really appreciate it, and we're glad to have you at all as part of the community. But if you'd like to do that, you can do so here in that link in the chat. Um, and then if you're watching on YouTube, if you are not part of this live audience right now, but if you're watching on YouTube and you have any questions, please feel free to go ahead and drop those in the chat if you'd like to, or drop those in the comments rather. I'm so used to Zoom terms, I'm sorry. Um, and we'll try to get back to those as soon as possible. In the meantime, if you have any questions, please let us know, uh, or thoughts or comments, uh, please let us know that too. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. We will see you online soon, hopefully tomorrow. Oh, and tomorrow's session is with uh, the illustrious Patrick Hughes, who teaches at the University of Texas at Austin. He'll be doing a session on memorization and how that works with uh, performance and how to do it better and stuff like that. Should be really cool. Anyway, thanks so much. See you soon. <laughs>